deep thought and stuff, but this is Stephen Rogers. Well, first off, I can't thank everybody enough for being here. It's just an incredible honor where anybody wants to talk about anything that any writer wrote. They're all like, we're all like this. So thank you for coming. And what I thought I would do is talk about how I went from being an accountant and a business executive to an author, and then what it was like to get published, and then beyond that, what this has meant to me from my own in my own faith. This book. Um, so, uh, in my business career or my professional career, I was an accountant. I worked for one of those massive accounting firms. I taught school for a few years, and then I was I worked as a business executive at this massive utility company, and. Um, it was, I always was successful, but my older brother would always tell me, I don't know why you're doing that, because you're a born classics major. Why are you doing this stuff for a living? Um, and he was right. And I'm a lifelong lover and reader of fiction. I read some nonfiction, but I haven't since in second grade, what is that, eight years old, whatever second grade is, I've been reading like crazy. I used to get in trouble because I would read my own book in school like during math class or something. You know, I get these notes a little bit. Um, and it's a little different back then. You know, you get a note home back then and there was no debate. It was like, you are going to do what the teacher says. Um, so I did that, but I've always had this strong desire to tell stories. And when I was working in the professional world, I did a little, like, couple of weird short stories, and, but nothing really. Um, I wrote half of a novel about an accountant who discovered fraud, and it was terrible, but I still have it. If anybody wants it, I'm happy. <laughs> um, but then in 2016, when I was 55, uh, we did the financial planning thing, and it turned out we could pull it off, so I retired uh, from that job, and Kathy, my wife, was in the back, so well, what are you going to do? Um, and I said, I want to try this writing thing. Um, and so I took a week off, and then I just started writing. Um, and I started, well, I'll get to the next slide. So what I did was I started with short stories. And being a former accountant, I did this mental calculation that Stephen King is getting older. So, no, I'm serious. I went through this process. Stephen King is getting older, so I'm going to need to fill that, I want to fill that more. So, I was writing short stories about people getting strangled and body parts getting mailed to UPS and, and, and all kinds of stuff. I, I had to research how to strangle somebody. And I went to the local, because I mean, I didn't know. So, so I went to the local library and did the search there um, because I didn't want to know my search history at all. So, so I did it in the library. But anyways, and then I did some workshops and conferences. And those are really important when you're first starting to write. Because they'll have a session on like how to do a character, or how to develop a plot, or how to do dialogue. Um, you can't go to 50 of them because they all kind of say the same thing. But I, I went to a few, and then I just practiced and practiced and practiced. I would write 600 word short stories, I'd write 30 page short stories. Um, and the thing I really learned was self-awareness about whether the writing's any good is really, really important. Because I didn't really even want to show it to anybody for the first 12, 14, 15 months. Um, but I could tell when something was reading okay and when it wasn't. And I knew my dialogue at first. I mean, well, it still needs work. I don't mean that like it's a finished thing, but it was horrible at first with dialogue. Um, but I also learned that you need to write what you want to write. When I tried to write thinking this is something that will sell, it was never, I mean, it was worse than the stuff that was bad. <laughs> um, but I kind of, I have, uh, right now, I have this novel, the one that was published. I have another one sitting in a binder at home that will never see the light of day, but it was a lot of fun. Um, I could actually convert that to a faith-based series if I wanted to, but I don't want to. Um, and then I had that funky little accounting novel, you know, to have that. Um, so this one is the one that made it out into the world after all of that work. And it was published in 2021, so that's roughly six years, five years, that from when I started to when it got published. And I'll talk about that. Um, so 
I was writing the Stephen King stuff, and we, Kathy, I like I like to travel, and Kathy loves to travel. Um, I don't go reluctantly, but she would go every six weeks if she could, um, and not to like Pennsylvania. It's got to be <laughs> ten miles over the ocean, ten hours over the ocean. Um, but we were on our way to Israel on a trip. And what happens when I started writing was I always say to myself, I wonder what would happen if. Uh, like this summer, we were on the boardwalk at the beach, and I turned to Kathy and said, what would happen if this thing just collapsed right now? Um, and, and then you, and out of every hundred, you get one or two ideas that you want to write about. So I, I thought, I wonder what would happen if I was an alcoholic who had just been released from rehab, and I had to take this trip. I had no idea why that came into my mind, but it did. And so I took out my little notebook, because I always journal, so I had a journal for the trip, and I wrote basically the first two pages of the book. I invented the character, Ben Cahill, although he was George Reed then. Um, he's had four names, um, but for a lot of different reasons, but he was George Reed, and I wrote what effectively is the first two pages, you know, a thousand edits ago, but the first two pages of the book. And then as we traveled, I journaled in his voice. So when we went to visit Masada, or we went to see the Dead Sea Scrolls or whatever, I would journal in his voice as if he was seeing it, yeah. and then I would write what the guide was saying about the location, the guide that we had. Um, and, uh, it, and I followed our itinerary as I did that. And the book almost 100% follows our itinerary. I did one poetic license, well, it, it, not everybody's read the book, but I did one poetic license at the end. Um, that was really important with when you visit. So then we came back, and uh, I, I talked. To, I explained to Kathy what I've been doing when I was scribbling like crazy in Israel. We hadn't really talked about it, and she said you might have a book there. And I said that's not my genre. And people have heard the story before, but in her nice way, she said you're not published. You don't have a genre. <laughs> Uh, I mean, when she says it so much, I'm sure she says it the way I would have said it the way I said it. She would have said something like, well, you know, you're still finding your way. Or um, so then I thought, okay, what do I want to happen in this book? What do I want if this guy's going, what's going to happen? And this isn't a spoiler because it's Christian fiction, so it has to be, I want to have a hopeful ending. And I want him to start finding his way out of his problems. And then I started messing around with all the supporting characters. Mm -hmm. And the supporting characters in the book are kind of composites of the people we traveled with, although some of them think that this one is me. <laughs> no, they do. One of them read it and said, that's me, right? And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> although I, did, I was telling someone before, the guide in the book, uh, Avi, mm -hmm. he, he, is, he is the same person we had. He could sue me for libel. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, he is 100%. Exactly. Almost some of the words were his. That are in the book. He doesn't mind that. Um, so then I had a writing coach who I had met at a writing conference. And he did a review of the book for me. And he didn't review it for like grammar and all that. He reviewed it for story structure. And his comment when he sent it back was, it's not quite ready for prime time, but this book can be ready for prime time. And he suggested the subplot, which is a little mini romance in there. He suggested that, so I layered that in. And then he said, before you start submitting this, you should get it professionally edited. And he said, I know this woman, Michelle Chinowith, and she has my permission to, be, to disclose everything about her, because I'm going to tell some things about her. Uh, and so I got in touch with her, and I sent the book to her. And I didn't know this when I sent it to her, but she's 30 years sober. Oh, and so she offered some really great insight. Mm -hmm. And her most, in, I mean, outside of all the editing stuff she did, for those who've read the book, there's a conversation at the end of the book between Ben and his wife. That was her idea. She said, put, put a conversation in at the end. Um, so we put that in. And then she said to me, I work as an editor for this publisher called Elk Lake Publishing, and I can submit the book on your behalf if you would like. And the way it works now, you either have to have an agent or an editor submit your book. No one really logs their book like over the walls or random house or something. <laughs> but it used to work that way, but it doesn't work that way anymore. And, and she said, but you may want to try to get a bigger publisher first. She said, because this book will get published. Um, 
And I said, no, 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 I, I really want to be published. So she sent it in on a Monday in January. I remember this distinctly because I was watching Tom Brady play for Tampa when the next one happened. <laughs> um, but he sent it in on a Monday, and that Sunday, I was sitting there watching a football game with Kathy and our son, and a contract just showed up in my email. No phone call, no nothing. Um, so I, um, it was actually, well, first off, Kathy thought that I was going to freak out, so Kathy was wondering what was going on. Uh, but I called them the next day, and I signed the contract, and, and all that. And then the real fun starts, because I had, I had done zero research about what happens after you get a publisher because I really, I mean, I was kind of hopeful, but you don't really think someone's going to publish a book. Um, and so the first thing I noticed was it said in the, in the uh, contract, the author agrees to deliver the publisher a completed manuscript within six months of this contract. And I said, well, I just sent you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they said, well, there's two things you have to do. You have to conform your book to our style guide. So they give you this, I don't know, 10 pages. And it's like, uh, for them, they want Bible verses and quotes, not italics. Other people want them in italics. If you refer to God as he, they like a little age, not a big age. Um, you know, stuff like that. They, she hates semicolons, so you use a dash. Um, that kind of thing. So you have to go back and reformat the whole thing and get rid of these little extra spaces. And all. So that took like a little while. And then they give you this list of what's called weasel words, which are 35 words that are overused by authors, and they're considered lazy writing. Mm -hmm. So it's like the word that, the word just, the word even. Uh, Kathy gave me half a dozen that she thought were specific to me, which I really appreciated. Um, and you had to pull those out. So I pulled those out, and I pulled 3,500 words out of the manuscript doing the weasel words thing. And not because there were 3,500 weasel words, but you just make everything more efficient mm -hmm. when you pull them up. So I did all that, and I did it in record time for the publisher because, and this says everything you need to know about me, I was so afraid that they were going to figure out I was a fraud. <laughs> they were going to pull the con I'm not, I am not making, this isn't like for laughs. So that I did it in like two months because I was so afraid she was going to pull the contract. Um, and so it was supposed to be published in September of 21, but I did this stuff so fast that they called me in March and said, are you willing to go in May? And I had this whole marketing plan set up through September. And for a second, I was about to say no. And then I said, you dummy. It's a Christian book with a Christian author, uh, publishing company. You should probably just say yes and see what happens. So we did. Um, and then, well, let, let me go back to here. So then it, it all went out. It was published. I started doing my thing. And now I'm here, whatever it is, 18 months later, doing things like this. So it's just, it was an amazing experience. And before I get to the next slide, what I want to talk about, though, is, and the next slide is the common questions I get. And the first question I almost always get is, this book autobiographical? Are you Ben? And I'm not in it. Well, Ben's sarcasm is me. But it, it is. And I mean, when a friend of my brother's who I've known since I was this high, read the book, and he called me up. He said, you haven't changed in 40 years. <laughs> But the alcoholism stuff is not me at all. I have zero, I mean zero issues with alcohol. But in our life, we have been surrounded by alcoholics and addicts. Um, and so I had a lot of things to pull on when I wrote the book. And this is the thing I discovered about myself. And it was when I was preparing, I forget who the talk was for, I was preparing for a talk. And I discovered that, you know, all those people around me, you know, you carry all this stuff in here, you know, anger and resentment and everything. I didn't release that until I finished the first draft of the book, which means that the book's nothing but a big fat journal entry that got published. And if it had never been published, it would have made a huge difference in my life. Um, so it was, that was amazing for me. And, and my personal faith journey, if that's what you want to call it, has changed completely since that happened. Um, and then I had to learn how to forgive myself for having those feelings, because when you have those feelings, you project them on the other person, and that's not helping them in their recovery at all either. Um, so I went through, all this happened last, this summer that we just finished. I went through this huge 
self, whatever you want to call it. Um, I mean, I'm not like I'm an accountant. I'm not like a super deep thinker. So this is, I'm grinding through all this over the summer. Um, and so I, I just that's that's where it ended. Now the other thing I, I want to mention, I forgot to say this, was during the publishing process, the single most stressful thing was this cover. <laughs> I mean, because in the contract it says, and I, I, I've checked with other writers, every publisher says this, they have 100% control over what's on the cover and what's on the back. Uh, and now they're nice enough to ask, right? So they asked and they, the publisher, the book designer and I, cover designer and I worked together and the, the first version of the cover looked nothing like this, absolutely nothing. And um, they had some guy walking through a door with like a nuclear blast behind him. <laughs> it was awful. But I made the mistake of asking too many people what they thought. And I got so much input that it was stressing me out like crazy. And so I called, uh, it, you know, in front of the book there's these endorsements. Yeah. Well, I called one of the guys, uh, this guy Frank Brantley, who gave me an endorsement. He's with my publisher and he says, stop worrying about it. He says, and his cover is beautiful in his book. And he said, they want to sell books way more than you do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Deb, who's the publisher, will never let a book go out that she doesn't like the cover on. Um, so after that, I relaxed. And we ended up pulling, this is, this is a composite, but this is an archway in Masada up in the desert. And this is the Western Wall. And he's walking. I wanted a guy walking through here. Yeah. And when I mentioned to the cover designer, she said, Deb's happy with the cover the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> but that was very stressful. Oh. So that's how it all flowed and what it has meant to me. And I thought, these are the questions I get most when I, when I speak, because I've done a lot of these talks now. The first one was the autobiographical question. The second one is, where did you pull the title from? And I pulled it because, you know, if, if you practice the Christian faith, the idea is you're supposed to bring it to other people. Or, but there's different ways of doing that, right? And I'm not the kind of person that's going to walk up to you and, sorry, here's some line of sight, and say, you know, you really need to do this and go to church or read the Bible or whatever. And I'm not going to stand on a street corner with a Bible and read. It's just not my style. There are people who that is their style. But my idea is that I live in a way that maybe they ask me, and maybe they step into the room with God, and then God works it out with them. So that's why it's called Into the Room. Um, and if you've read the book, there's a scene around that. Um, and the question, what has surprised me most about publishing the book was how much of the marketing falls to the author. Uh, with me, it's almost 100% of the marketing. Because um, I'm, I'm a really small, independent publisher. Uh, so, and I don't mind that. I like, I like the marketing. But, you know, you do a... You, I do my little sale. I'm my own publicist. I, buy, I try to do five contacts a week and try to get in touch with people and go speak to Rotary Clubs or whatever. Um, instead, one interviewer asked me what do you want readers to take from the book? And that's a really difficult question to answer because it's such a personal thing with people that read a book like this. I just hope they see something that, well, if they have an addiction, I hope they see their addiction in the way this guy behaves. Um, I mean, I have enough problems without me making judgments about other people's addictions. I mean, I've got my own issues with that. Um, but that, and, or maybe they want to go to Israel because of the book, um, that kind of thing. And, and I get to speak to groups that are going to Israel sometimes, and it's really fun to, to tell them about the trip and what it meant to me. And what I learned was what I said earlier, the thing about my forgiveness issues um, in my heart. It, it really has had a profound effect on me. And I know I'm talking at 6,000 words a minute, but um, that's kind of the book and the process. And I love talking about the process. And if you know people around me that are trying to become writers, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk to them. Uh, oh, I, I get this question when it's hysterical. And it's, what would you tell a new writer? And I was like, I am a new writer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I mean, I am. I mean, I'm this little teeny publisher, you know. I was, sold whatever many books I've sold. But I did say, and this is something I learned, write what you want to write. Because not everybody's going to like your book. So you got to make sure you do. And it's interesting, probably the most direct negative response I've gotten has been people I've traveled to Israel with. 
And I think it's because they were expecting to read their trip, their experience in the book. I think, but they, they can't relate to Ben or whatever. And I don't mind that because not every, I mean, someone can sell a million books and people don't like their books, so it's fine. Uh, but write the book you want to write is something I really learned from this. Well, plus from my little foray into trying to be Stephen King, I learned that too. Um, so now what I do is I've got the book. Here we go. There it is. So now I really write two things. I've got this book, and I'm working on a sequel. Then, and it's, it's got travel, and he's going to go to the island of Iona. Well, actually, he's there now. I'm right now. Right? <laughs> um, but he's in Iona, which is one of these pilgrimage islands, and um, we went there in May. May, and um, and he's taking the next steps in his journey. And I also do a, uh, I do roughly a monthly column, blog column, where I just do like silly observations about life. Um, one of them, well, Kathy had got the worst marriage proposal in the history of the world, so I wrote a column about that. Um, I wrote one called Pigs at the Door, which was watching the guys come to date my daughter. Um, and, 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 uh, and I wrote, we, we got a Manny Petty for Kathy's birthday, I wrote about that. Um, but they're just meant to be fun, you know, but then I do my, a little newsletter in there about my writing. And, I just added a thing where I do a book of the month. So those are the two things I write. Um, and I've got an idea for two more books about Ben, and then I have a historical fiction idea uh, based in Patmos with uh, the Apostle John. But I'm not ready to write that. I mean, I don't think I'm even close to good enough to write that yet, and I'm hoping I develop enough that I can write that. Um, but it means we get another trip, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. That's how I went from accountant to author. And I like being able to do this with a church group because I can talk about the faith side of it. When I do it with a secular group, I call it what I do with my permanent vacation. I just talk about the writing part of it. Um, but it has meant so much to me personally in my faith that, like I said, it was never published that way, but perfectly happy. Uh, so what I really like to do is answer questions about the book or the trip or Israel, uh, anything you might want to ask questions about, if there are any. Yes, sir. Did the people on the trip at the time know that you were okay? No, I was just journaling. Well, I mean, they knew I was journaling because I was yeah. screwing yeah. away everywhere we went. Um, yeah. No, because I didn't even really even know. I mean, I thought I was just practicing. I didn't think it was going to become a book. Um, because I have all, like, when I sketched out the character Ben, I mean, I got a whole binder full of weird little characters I made up. Matter of fact, I pulled one of them into the second book, but um, I just make up characters and write about them because it's just practice and getting used to what you want these people to be. And it gets out a lot of demons, it's not demons, but I overthink it, so it gets it out through the writing. Did you read, you know, C.S. Lewis or any other mm -hmm. Christian authors to try and. Okay. Yeah, I. Yeah, I've read, I haven't read a ton of Christian fiction, but I read C.S. Lewis, and I, I read a few, most of the Christian fiction is romance. Um, like 80% of the Christian fiction I bumped is either romance, or it's like science fiction with a Christian twist. So I read them, but there's, there, um, the closest, and I want, before I say this, I am not comparing my book in any way to the form to this book. But the closest book I've read to my tone was The Shack. Um, now, this book is not the chef, I want to be very clear, I don't think it is, but, um, but that was the kind of thing I was looking for, was a book that people would maybe see their faith journey or their faith in it as opposed to a fantasy, and I can't write romance, I, it's not my, I don't be able to do it. Talk about screw tape letters. About who? Screw tape letters. Oh yeah, and screw tape letters, I forgot about the, in the book, the stuff from Joseph, where Joseph kind of does his little reports, that was my nod to the screw tape letters, mm -hmm. where he writes as the demon. Um, and I, I made up Joseph in the book because I had to get away from Ben. Because um, the book's in the first person, right? So that means I'm technically him for two and a half hours a day. And so I, I made up Joseph so I get away from Ben. And then at the end of the day, Kathy knew enough to like, just let me cook dinner or something until I, because I would, I would be in his head 
for a good half hour after I stopped writing. And each one messed up too. I mean, we're all messed up, right? We're all messed up, but he is one messed up too. So. Did, did you know when you started writing the book how it was gonna end? Yeah, everything I write, there's two kinds of writers. They're called plotters, planners, and pantsers. And I'm a pantser, which, but I know how every book's going or any, every story's gonna begin and end, but I have no idea what's gonna happen in the middle. Planners, or like plotters, they outline their whole book ahead of time. But I knew, it, I knew, I almost always even know what the last scene's gonna be. Like the book I'm writing now, I know what the last scene's gonna be. I actually know what the last scene of the next book is gonna be. It's just a question of, it's a lot of work. <laughs> you know? um, Although I have started with the second book, I'm doing a little bit of the planning for each chapter because it, it, I can, it could go on forever. I've got to find a way to keep them moving along. Mm -hmm. No, I really enjoyed the book. I was just okay. curious, um, you know, during your trip to Israel, what was it about some of the places that you visited that you mm -hmm. felt would be uh, powerful enough oh my to goodness. help transform some of these? They, well, boy. I guess part of it was the, the answer is yes, right? The whole yeah, place yeah. is like that. Yeah. But the the three places that had the biggest impact on me were well, the Garden of Gethsemane, mm -hmm. because a lot of times when you visit places in Israel, they say according to tradition, this is the place. Mm -hmm. You know, two thousand years of people saying this is where it happened, but Gethsemane is Gethsemane, mm -hmm. and there's there's and the olive trees all look like they're a billion years old, and there's one there that's actually two thousand years old, mm -hmm. so it was actually there mm -hmm. when Jesus was there. And, you, and you're walking saying he's probably somewhere, you know, around here. So that had a huge impact on me. Um, the other thing that had a huge impact on me was, I never forgot Qumran, which is where the Dead Sea Scrolls are. Because just to, to know that there's a, that the Bible had actual written evidence that far back, and that these people, I mean, where Qumran is, is the it, there's nothing there. I mean, the fact that they lived there for the sole purpose of doing this is was mind-boggling to me. And uh, and they found like a complete book of Isaiah when they did the Dead Sea. So that had a huge impact. And then when we there's two tombs that they say could be Jesus' tomb. We went to one that was the Garden Tomb, and that's in the book. Um, but that had the biggest impact. And there's a scene in the book where he sits down on the wall and he reads the Gospel of John. I actually did that. After we came out of the, and we, and everyone, we couldn't take pictures inside the tomb. It was just too, uh, we, so I, today I was so my man, I wish I had a picture inside the tomb so I could show people today. <laughs> but I sat down and I read and I had that thought that this happened somewhere in a 10 foot radius of where I'm sitting. And so that was a huge impact. But the whole, the only thing in Israel that didn't really have much of an impact on me was the uh, David's Ancient City section. I just thought that was terrible. It didn't do it. I mean, other people had had a profound impact. And that prayer house that's in the book, which was an after, it was kind of an add-on because something was closed, that had a big impact on me. Well, you can tell, right? I put it in the book, but that had a big impact on me. But the whole trip was just, it's not a big deal. It's a pilgrimage. It really is. I'm sorry. Go ahead. As a follow-up to Kevin's question, Stephen, I think when I read the book, the biggest um, analogy I could find was, I don't know if you've read any of Joseph Gerzioni's books. Um, the whole Joshua series, Joshua, oh, I should try that. Joshua yes. in the City. Um, there's several books that he's written, but it's a continuation of the Joshua story. Okay. Um, but he, he writes very similar to fictional people. Yep. Um, and you, know, you mentioned the shack, like you try to figure out which one is Jesus, who right. is, who right. wrote the book. But I couldn't, there's, there's a lot of similarities in the way you wrote and the way that Joseph Gerzioni writes. Oh, I should try that. Yeah. Yeah. Is that good? Well, and it's good practice. Yeah, because I've read all of these books. Yeah. Um, there's, there's probably seven or eight of them, but Joshua was the first one, and there's Joshua in the city, uh, Joshua in the Holy Land. Um, but Joshua was the first one, but it'd be interesting for you to read it because the writing style is even the yeah. same. Well, and I love it because. Every time I read, I get new tips about story structure. Mm -hmm. The only problem I have now is because I've been through professional editing, is I'll read something now and I start rearranging sentences. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or if I see one of those weasel words, I'm like, oh my God. Um, 
But I use reason words as my first edit on everything now. I have this checklist. Yeah. And for the oh, yeah. 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 well, you gotta worry these. I mean, are you just like throwing in, not worrying about grammar or whatever? You just like throwing in the stuff all over. They tell you that's what you're supposed to do, but I can't do that. Okay. So I'm a slow writer because I can't just get like an event. I have to make sure it reads at least reasonably well to me. I mean, it all needs to get fixed or changed. But yeah. So I, I, I can't just throw up on the page, as they say. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, some people can do like 2,000 words a day, which is roughly 10 pages. But I can't because I always have to play with the words and, and if the dialogue doesn't sound right, and I don't know if that's good or bad. But style. Yeah, it's a style. Yeah. So when you're home, are you still writing by hand or on a keyboard? Oh, no, on a keyboard. Although I have a little notepad where I write little notes about it, like don't forget this later, or yeah. that's the closest thing I come to plotting ahead of time is, you know, uh, you know this happened here, don't forget about this later, um, so you can bring it back in. And Steve, just what you what you publish is you do is if you put the door, is it easy to get the next one published? Uh, well, like, it depends. You have a name and you have a publisher that it, publishes it's stuff. easier to get noticed. Now, my publisher has said that she will publish the next book. Yeah. Because she likes how hard I work trying to sell books. She really does. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think she likes the book, too. But uh, she said, yeah, send me the book when you're ready. We'll get you an editor. And I hope it's Michelle again, but it's whoever she says, and then we'll publish it. And that's usually about five months from her, from when she gets it. And the thing is, is that no matter what she says, I'm not going to send it until I think it's really, really ready. So I'll be playing with it until it goes in. I can't send her something that I don't think is ready to go. I just can't do that. Um, so I don't know what I want to. I want to get it there like next week, but it's probably going to be sometime over the winter. If I get my button finished. Uh, you go through like ups and downs, dry spells, rewriting, oh, yeah. and all that stuff. Well, poor cat. I mean, I come upstairs and then my sports finish. And she's like, Oh, we're at that point. <laughs> and then I'll come up the next day and say, it's not too bad. You know, and, um, or I'll try to go get a part-time job at like Cabela's or something. <laughs> oh yeah, I don't have, I never have any problem like getting stuff down, but it's just, you know, reading them like this is terrible. And, um, but I think that's pretty true of everybody. Um, so Steve, I, yeah. I've known you a long time. And I, I was, really um, struck with how you bridge the cynicism and the othering of our classic pilgrim, right? You know, the noble holy moments and that sort of thing. And how you, you know, and, and to me it kind of brought me in. Because I had to, you know, I was like, oh God, I'm going to Aquinas him? Bend? Like, well, who is this? Yeah. We haven't talked to a long time. And that, you know, and then I realized that, you know, that was my only, my anger and cynicism, cynicism mm. around some things. And also just so the world we're in, because I feel like, Sometimes my faith has been absconded in, in politics lately. So it was just really artful, I think, for you to actually use Ben as the cynic alcoholic who had a base, who had an experience as a Christian, but didn't own it. Right. And then how you kind of took the words that I think a lot of us, well, that I saw or I witnessed, people kind of just being a little edgy because they don't, you know, like, what is that? Mm -hmm. What is the misery? You can't, yeah, it's too good to be true. And so I, I think it was very interesting to see you kind of bridge that. And it made it more approachable, right? It's like, you know, it's not a, it's not a, you will be, con you know. Oh, God, no. You, you know, you, it's not a born again kind of situation. It's a redemption <laughs> story. It doesn't have to be a Christian story necessarily. I don't no. see Hallmark picking it up. <laughs> it's gonna be an Easter story. <laughs> I'm just get ready. So I'm gonna be on the screenplay because it's you know it's pretty cool, but you know it you know it, it was cool because I think it had you know clearly I knew it was you know knowing it was pretty funny to hear the author. Oh yeah, and you know like just the just the way you you describe things and it just made me chuckle and it you know makes makes me wonder how other people read because I'm like why well, you know I can hear the voice of that. But um, nice job in the, oh, well, just in the, you know, making it approachable for the average cynic. Well, and, you know, I mean, I've always had a faith, but it's grown recently, but I don't try to, like, people have to ask me. 
I don't, I mean, I don't think I just walk up to people and say that. So I'm a little bit like Ben that way. And sometimes, like one time, he, he made a comment like, "Do they pray all the time here or whatever?" Yeah. yeah I did that once on a trip because they were praying so much. I was like, oh. <laughs> 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 Please just go to the next stop. <laughs> <laughs> See, but I, thank you. And I liked about the four flaws that you wrote it, but in my line of work. The power of words that it reminded me in my line of work how much what I say mm -hmm. in the homilies impacts people's lives. Mm -hmm. like, in reading, like in reading your book, it was very easy to get a visual of like the times they're on the bus and where they even when they're sitting on the bus mm -hmm. it made a difference. Yeah. Um, so the power of words to me was a good reminder to me that like. I need to be aware of what I'm saying because it's impacting someone's life who's sitting in front of me. Um, you know, you write it for a living and I have to speak it for a living, so um, I was very grateful for that. Although, to clarify, I'm not making a living. No. <laughs> to clarify, neither <laughs> stuff in the book that, you know, I, when I read it, you know, I was thinking, like, oh, that would be a great home. Yeah. 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 Well, you I mean, the whole forgiveness theme of how, like, these people know they hear me all the time. I'm constantly reminding people what I think is missing in the world is just a basic human mm -hmm. yeah. kindness. And the way that the people on the trip related to him yes. at various times in his life for a variety of reasons, like, you know, why is he on the bus now like the rest of us? You know? Um, and, and it was okay for them. Like, yeah, I people. know people like yeah. those people. Yeah. And, um, one reviewer who wasn't a faith-based reviewer said the most that they were unrealistic with supporting characters. And, uh, I mean, I didn't. It's fine. It was, it was publicity, you know. But um, See, I found just the opposite. Yeah. When yeah, I, was reading it, I know people. I know people like Ruth. Yeah. You know? Well, heck, Kathy's half a Ruth. Yeah. Um, so um, you know, but I know there was a woman on the trip who. Remind me by based Ruth on physically, you know, her look and all that. And they, yeah, just, and the woman that knows all the Bible verses, mm -hmm. I, I don't know people who know them that well. Although, they, what you, there is a woman on the trip who thinks that's her. That's me. And we did have a younger woman on the trip who I based Annie on, but it's not her. You know, mm -hmm. but, uh, we did have. Did you send a manuscript of the book to the people on the trip before you published it, or was this after? I, I only sent, I sent it to the guy who organized our trip to make sure I got the Israel stuff right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't, no, I didn't send it to him, because there, was, there wasn't enough in there that, it wasn't them. So, mm -hmm. so this, these are all responses since it's been published. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. They've gotten yeah. both on their own, for their own reasons, and... No, I did. I did send it to six people after the first draft was done. Uh, different people for different reasons. They called beta readers, and they gave me input. Um, matter of fact, the biggest comment I got was they couldn't like Ben from the beta readers. And so, and this is Kathy's heard this a million times. So it's a funny story. There's an author named Brad Parks, and I know him like if I see him. I mean, I don't, I don't hang out, but he writes a book a year, and he writes these thrillers. He's very successful. And I saw him at this event, and he, and he knew I was writing this book. He said, well, how'd the book come? And I said, well, it's good, except no one likes my main character. <laughs> and he said, that's, and he looked at me like I was a two-year-old. He said, that is the easiest thing to fix. He says, just get him a dog. <laughs> he said, he said it's writing 101. He says, you get him a dog, or you have him save a cat. <laughs> now, I couldn't do either one of those because I was traveling, so that's what, that's what I made up the thing where he reads to the seniors. Oh, yes. That was a direct yeah. result of my beta reader. Oh. Uh, but you also have to be careful with beta readers because one beta reader wanted me to pull Joseph out of the book. Oh. And I did not want to do that. Um, but what they teach you when you go to these workshops is if you hear from one and you don't like it, 
or not typos or whatever, but like about the story structure, do what you want to do, but if you hear it from two, you definitely should make a change. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. Um, but it, that, yeah, no one liked that. <coughs> I didn't expect the end. Oh, yeah. I didn't expect the ending as it was at oh, all. Wow. Who Peter and Joseph really is. Oh, oh, right, yeah. And it was like, okay, now I have to stop and think about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah that was, I don't even know how that came to me. It just came to me one day that I was going to, I knew I was going to write the little interludes. Yeah. But I said, well, heck, I'll put Peter on one side because I admire him so much. And then and then I think the most underappreciated person in the New Testament is Joseph. Because, mm -hmm. you know, he does all this stuff and he, I don't know, signs on for lack of a better word, you know, with all that, and then he just disappears. So I said, I'm giving him some first. <laughs> that was the exact thought. Of it. I feel the exact same way. It was nice to hear Joseph talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I just think he's, you know, he just disappears. You know, but it was only at the end that you realized that. Yeah, Joseph. Yeah. I suspect. Well, I mean, I gave it up. I gave some clues, and um, the guy who wanted to take it out um, is incredibly intelligent, and he figured it out like the second entry or something, and he just thought it was too obvious. And, and, and he personally does not believe that spirits are floating around. He thinks you go into the ground and you wait until the big whatever happens at the end, and then they all come up. So uh, I don't think he theologically liked that part of it. It was a fun comment. Take it out. No. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else I can answer? I can't answer, but boy, <laughs> it was so compelling. Well, I couldn't put the chat on. Well, thank you. <laughs> and it was intriguing. I loved those entries. It, it startled me the first, and it was like, oh, okay, more, oh, more, more, more. And I really, like Father said, I really felt like. I was there on the trip. Well, thank you. Is what you, because I don't think I'll ever make it. <laughs> um, that was what I, really, I was hoping that's what would happen. Yes. Um, because for me, it's really you just don't know, right? You just write it and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and doing progress reports is kind of different. Yeah, well, I, my theory is there's always something going on on that side of the equation that you don't know about. Mm -hmm. So I thought I'd pretend I knew about it. You know, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. I obviously made it all up. <laughs> have you have you gotten any insight into whether people who are addicted to eat alcohol or, or something else like Reddit and what kind of response they have? Oh yeah, have yeah. What kind of response is that? Uh, it's been well. It depends on the person. You know, one person. I don't think it made much of a difference. But when the book first came out, I went up to a guy I know who's in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I gave him a copy of the book. And they said, if you think this is worth it, give me $12 next week. Um, mm -hmm. And then he bought 10. Wow. And he gave them up. So uh, he really thought, he really liked that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so that was good. But that's the person who has made this step. Mm -hmm. Oh, and yeah, you know, I don't know if it's made. I haven't heard of that. I mean, in, in terms of, yeah, he's already in alcohol. Yeah, he was sober forever yeah. for, for a long time. Um, you know, I don't know that if, it's, if anybody who, if it's had anybody look at themselves. I have, based on my experience, you're not going to do it until they're good and ready to do it. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. that, that was so compelling and I think um, gave me more insight into what someone with that kind of a problem has yeah. to do with him. I mean, people would know in different stages and uh, it just struck me that, oh my gosh, <laughs> it was like, you know, you were right there. But and the thing I've learned from my life experience, you know, you shouldn't speak in generalities, but but the vast, vast majority of people that are in that problem with, with those addiction problems, underneath it all feel incredibly guilty mm -hmm. about what it is they're doing to themselves and to those around them. Mm -hmm. But because they can't give up what it is that's causing it, they get defensive and angry about it. Mm -hmm. And that comes out at the person in front of them. So it's just, it, I understand that. But I've seen it, and I, I've read about it and all that. We learned it through other sources, but you're just angry. And, um, well, yeah. I'm feeling so worthless, you know, oh, and hopeless. Anybody, anybody I, I believe, anybody who's actually successfully overcome those kinds of addictions, it, 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 
it's as successful as anything else a human being's ever done. It's because they are in prison. Um, they truly, truly are. Uh, it's just amazing to me when they come through. And they never stop working on it. I mean, a guy who was 30 years sober, still, he says, I still get urgent. And I still work on it. So I admire them tremendously. And they're very funny people. Because they'll tell you stories about curling your hair and they tell them like it's a joke because it's all over. Anything else I can answer? Or? I mean, I will. Yeah. I, I have a question. Were there specific things you had to research to write the book? I mean, you talked about strangulation before, but I guess that's not part of um, it. <laughs> really, just the truth. And I mean, the personalities of, the, of Ben. Kind of, kind of grew as I wrote, and I had to go back and fix stuff. But when I did put the research, I mean, the stuff in about Israel, I would go off of my notes and memory, but then I would go online and research to make sure I got it. Mm -hmm. The beautiful thing about the internet, mm -hmm. that's why books aren't this big anymore. Because yeah. people don't need it for, you know, when James Mitchell wrote, no one was ever going to see Alaska, mm -hmm. you know, unless you were super wealthy. So he gives you all the description, but now people can go look at it, so you just have to get a taste of it. Mm -hmm. So I would go on the internet and make sure I got it. The history right and the appearance right and all that sort of thing. Because um, to me, the whole the whole country was brown, right? But it's more than that. But all I remember is brown sandstone everywhere. But it was way more than that. And so I had to go back to history. I mean, it's an incredibly beautiful place, which was surprising. But there's a lot of beauty. There. The desert, though, is like a moon. I'm not. It's like a moon street. The desert out there is just it is desert. <laughs> Make sure you're on the bus in this area. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for allowing me to do that. I know most of you have a book, but I have them if you'd like them. And just as a tip, this would fit in a Christmas card. <laughs> <laughs> And if you know people like audiobooks, you can go online and get the audiobook. Oh, nice. 